probably have journals upon journals of sermon notes and preparations and things like this, and I've not gone back to them. So every time I study, especially with this, uh, the angelic hierarchy and the structure of the kingdom, and ultimately we're going to be focusing on the spirits that are listed in the Bible. And uh, I'm going to end up giving you a bunch of scripture that I'm going to actually put in the description on band for this. So because there's just too many of them, but to, to speak about each one of these spirits so that you can study it for yourself. And so refuting these spirits is to be praying for the binding of that spirit and the releasing of the opposite, which is ultimately truth. Uh, we were talking about that. So um, this is getting a lot more in depth in the study. So I'm actually excited about it. We'll go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. I do, I did miss worship this morning here. I know Jens wasn't be able to make it. So we need to be in prayer for him as he's uh, traveling to Oklahoma. I did have a, a brief conversation with him last night through text. And he said they didn't deliver certain materials for a project that he's, this basement project, this big basement project that he's been talking about. So he has to run up to Oklahoma to, uh, to get those things for tomorrow. So that's why he's not with us today. Um, Ken is at home today. And uh, we know what was going on there. We've been lifting up in prayer. I pray that if people have been, you know, texting him or saying... Hello, I think he's doing fine, doesn't feel anything. So asymptomatic or nothing, but <laughs> in Jesus' name. But, uh, but thank you for your consideration for everyone um, as well. Uh, Mom, if you didn't know, um, oh, praise God. Uh, Mom Marlene, God bless you. Uh, she uh, had... Uh, Praise God, there's a praise in this. I know AJ's probably shared this with everyone else, but she went to the uh, hospital with other issues that need to be addressed. And while she was there, um, she ended up having a mild heart attack while at the hospital. And uh, they, they quickly moved on that. The Lord showed great favor in the attendance of Marlene while she was there by the doctors and the nurses. And then there was no difficulties for AJ to visit during visiting hours which I know that uh, just a few weeks ago, somebody was having difficulties getting to the hospital for family members. And AJ was shown great favor awesome. uh, in that. So that's a praise to God. Amen. Doctors were able to, uh, to identify what the issue was and there was some blockage in a couple of her uh, uh, valves to the heart. And uh, uh, crazy enough, there was actually pretty severe, I think 80 and 90% blockage but uh, surgery this week and uh, ended up putting in four stents. And she uh, was able to go home a few days ago. And uh, today I think she's probably feeling uh, the best day. Maybe the past few days have been very difficult um, recovering from that. And, uh, and so for her to be on this morning is pretty awesome. I know that uh, I believe Michael, um, is with her at the house and AJ went to the, the, the home so that they, he could lead in worship, which is just another testament to uh, how important the kingdom is, that, uh, that it's able to, to be done that way. So that's very positive, Amen. considering that, you know, this week in prayer, I know I, I reached out to the church Monday morning and was, you know, asking everybody to pray. And uh, when AJ called me and said that she was out, I did not personally expect to get emotional. Um, but it's almost like when you're fighting, 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 and then it's over. And it's just like a, a relief. And so it was a real blessing. I'm sure that a lot of people felt that way. I was su surprised by my reaction, but I was absolutely excited. Uh, very excited to know that. So amen for that. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Father, you are so good to us. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide to us. Lord, you, um, you make a way when it seems difficult. Lord, I pray that we would keep our minds steadfast on you and not on this world, um, that we would put our complete and total faith in you, not in men, not in governments, not in our bank accounts, not in our positions at our places of employment, but Lord, that we would fully place our trust in you. Lord, we are... Uh, rapidly realizing that these are in fact the last days. 
And Lord, we want to be faithful in our mission to build your kingdom, to be used of you. And Lord, I thank you for the joy that you place in our heart. It is the joy of our salvation. It is the hope of an eternity with you. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. You have always been faithful. and We pray that we would be found faithful as you call us to uh, engage in a world that is in so desperate need of you, more so than ever. Lord, keep us in your grace. Keep us in your mercy. And Lord, I pray over each home that you would bless that home, that you would protect that home, that you would make every provision for that home that has so graciously opened their doors to host these meetings. Lord, we ask for your blessing over your word, and we ask these things in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ, our God and our Lord. Amen. 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 So if you would open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, I just want to read one passage. There is uh, a lot of scripture that I will reference, but uh, won't actually go to it. So if you'll write it down, this really is designed for us to study and not just to hear a message. It's more than just a sermon. It's a teaching. And so it is important for you to take the time to explore this. As I study this, the structure of the kingdom, every time, it's very sobering to me. And I was talking with Brother Jim this morning. There is a war that is going on in the spiritual realm all the time. And it is intense. And I know that uh, angels are operating on our behalf in areas that we aren't aware of. And I was, uh, as we were having our discussion, it was just talking about how, how do the angels view us? How, how do they think of us? Where they're heavily engaged in, in this uh, kingdom warfare and at stake are people's souls. For all eternity, someone is going to live in heaven or they're going to live in hell. And angels most certainly take that to heart. And when they look down on God's chosen, created to become his children, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and there is a lack of engagement, a lack of concern, a lack of you know heartfelt resolve to build the kingdom, you just get to thinking, what do they see? How do they view that? Are angels just waiting to move into battle, waiting on God's children to move forward? So we're going to look at this and kind of get a picture of heaven, but um, one of the places as you look at structure uh, is Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then we're told to put on the full armor of God. And uh, studying that and understanding your armor is important because you want to become very, very proficient with your weapon system. In the military, that's the very first thing that you learn is how to be proficient with your weapons. What weapons are you going to carry? I had an M4 uh, with an M203 grenade launcher on it, and I became very proficient with those two weapons. Uh, qualified with the 9, became very proficient. Um, when you're in combat, you definitely want to understand your weapon system. Um, I understood my netting. I knew where all my ammo was. I knew where everything was in my ruck. I knew everything about my tracked vehicle when I was a driver and everything about the weapon system when I became a gunner. And so you, you're prepared to go into combat. Now, once you understand your weapon systems and as believers, this is a very novice, uh, very elementary uh, part of our walk. We should not, as Cross Life, when we come together on a Sunday, really need to go into the whole armor of God and what it is 
and how to become proficient with it. That's something for babes in Christ. If in fact you do have difficulties understanding, um, AJ or myself would be happy to take time separately so that you can fully understand what those pieces are. Most of them are defensive, obviously. Um, one is a weapon, it is the Word. And I make a big emphasis on the Word of God, being in the Word of God. This is going to be your weapon. This is the answer. If you are not uh, well-equipped in how to fight with the Word, um, then, then you need to go back to basic training kind of a deal. I'd be happy to walk you through that. Um, and then there are others that do not care about the Word of God. And so I view you uh, as not being a fighter. You're not a warrior for Christ if you're not in the Word. And so people that want to spend time with me that find no value in their weapon system, I, I, have, a, I have a difficulty spending a lot of time with them. And in these last days, I think that's going to be more so, that the remnant will rise up and there will be a separation that we see in these last days. The Bible calls it a great falling away. And that's something that we're going to see. And in other churches, what you'll see is you'll see people removing themselves from those churches because they aren't teaching and they're not providing any meat and they're going by the ways of the world instead of following the word. And so they'll separate themselves from those churches and that will become the remnant. And I'm praying that Cross Life will grow to a place where maybe we have our own facility, where we have a base camp. That is uh, something I was praying about this morning. And there are many opportunities coming on the horizon, but I'm also very pleased that we're waiting on the Lord because as we were looking last year for a base camp. We ultimately found out that 2020 was a lot about a pandemic and was a lot, a lot, a lot about social distancing. And this could have been devastating to us if we had taken on a huge obligation, a monthly obligation, and, and watched what we wanted to build for the Lord fall away. It would have been very disheartening. And we would have realized that, you know, we might have jumped the gun and pushed open the door before it was ready. And so waiting on the Lord is very, very important. What Satan would love for Cross Life, to, Cross Life to do is to get themselves in a place where they can't meet obligations. And he will enter in division, disunity, and, uh, and ultimately try to tear the church apart. That's, uh, that's what he wants to do. So that's enough about the full armor of God. That's something that uh, AJ or myself would love to help you with. There are others as well that fully understand the armor of God. I want to encourage husbands like myself to be the primary discipler in your home. Um, the nuclear family is under attack. And so uh, Suzette's primary discipler is myself. And uh, even as I was going over the message yesterday, I was talking with her about several key points uh, that we might not even cover today. You know, just some things that were uh, pretty amazing to give her some insight into the kingdom. Um, she is my greatest supporter <laughs> uh, in this world. And so I want her to be well-equipped and, uh, and prepared to fight uh, on my behalf. So principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't necessarily think a lot about that in our daily lives. And so um, the structure of God's kingdom, and you can see this throughout scripture, um, it might take a study of yours, but I wanted to just list the, the powers and principalities that are, uh, that are listed in scripture. And again, as we talk about Satan's uh, Satan's structure, he's not a creator. So what he's done is he's exactly mirrored what was already created. And I was thinking, we see the same thing in the way our government is formed, the way companies have hierarchies and so on and so forth. 
Um, we didn't create that. There wasn't some guy who says, you know what we need? We ought to have a leader and then maybe have some supervisors. And then under those supervisors, we'll have some other folks that work for them. Um, yeah, you're a genius. Uh, scripture defined order. And so the way the kingdom is set up, and you can see this, um, I'll run through it quickly because we've done it once before, <clears throat> but study this on your own. This is very important as we go forward, especially in these last days, that I cannot be the primary discipler for everyone. But the Holy Spirit can. Amen? And so I can give an outline, and then it's incumbent upon you to get with the Lord uh, every day and study these things because it is a full outline. It's robust for you to be able to ask God about specific things and watch your own growth and development take place. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the way that the, uh, the kingdom is structured, obviously, we see in Isaiah chapter 6. We see the throne of God, and at the throne of God, you see angels. Those angels are called seraphim. These are mighty and powerful angels. And because they're always in the presence of the Lord, I personally believe that none of them were swayed by Satan in the fall because he couldn't get close enough to them to persuade them because they would not leave the glory of God. These angels are mighty and massive, and they have six wings. With two, they cover their face. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly, is what it says in Isaiah chapter 6. And I believe that this is a perfect representation of uh, the reverence that they have by covering their faces. Uh, when you go to take wings, if you think about it, and cover your feet, you're also going to be uh, uh, covering uh any areas that would be immodest, I would say. And so there is a reverence, there is a purity, and then there is service, the ones that are flying. So just in the very way that they are conducting themselves before the throne, they're acting in purity and reverence and service. And that is a picture of how we should be serving the King of glory. So you have the seraphim. Um, in Scripture, it talks about cherubim and uh or cherubs or actually it would be cherub is singular cherubim is plural um but you have cherub and we know that cherubs are guardians of his glory to some extent uh with the ark of the covenant it says that there were uh, cherubim that were on either side of the mercy seat um we know through scripture that satan himself was a cherub and he was a, a, a covering cherub. And he covered the glory of God until pride ultimately was found in him, or iniquity, as the Bible says. So you have seraphim and cherubs. Then you have thrones. <clears throat> the thrones are described in Ezekiel, and they have wheels and eyes, and they move about. And they're very difficult to understand when you actually read it as far as trying to get a picture of who they are, but these thrones are the carrier of his glory and his throne. And they're going to stay very close to the Lord as well. Cherubim uh, obviously have a place in the presence of God, as do other angels. And we see that in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, where all the angels are gathered around the throne. And strangely enough, Lucifer presents himself to God. And this began the plight for Job as God asks Satan, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> How would you like to be brought up to Satan by God? <laughs> not very many people are praying for that one, are they? <laughs> like that's not in my prayer set in the mornings, but uh, um, <clears throat> Lord, won't you bring me up to Satan? Am I? Wow. How you doing? So it just shows where Job was, and that's a really great book to read and understand. Fourthly, you have uh, dominions that are described in the Bible, <clears throat> and these are leaders of lesser angels. And I don't necessarily like using lesser angels because angels are all powerful, and some angels that seem to be in the hierarchy can actually be ascribed authority over angels that seem to be 
uh, of a different rank. So they're given special uh, authority over. Dominions are those. Um, dominions uh, are leaders of lesser angels. And then you have, uh, fifthly, uh, virtues. <clears throat> Jim and I were talking about this this morning beforehand, and I, uh, I liked his question. His question said, was, what is the opposite of virtue? Because when you think of virtues, you think of noble and good things. And these angels of virtues basically have different characteristics. And somebody can uh, be given a strong virtue of honesty in a situation that they could easily lie in and a believer is empowered, we oftentimes, and rightly so, give credit to the Holy Spirit. But at certain times, angels intervene. And that's what angels of virtue do. They intervene in a situation, not unlike what we've seen in Scripture before, but they intervene to, to bring that out. And uh, honesty would be one of those. The opposite of virtues is iniquity. The opposite of virtues is a vice. And so these angels uh, pretty much have classified them as interveners. They intervene in the affairs of men to change, help to change the course. And we don't often even know this or recognize that they're present. But this is how this battle in the spiritual realm is going on all around us all the time and we don't even realize it. And somebody is confronting us about something and it would be very easily to, to lie, to get out of the conversation or something along these lines. Instead, angels come in to reinforce in the battle because they can see the demonic forces that are trying to accuse or abuse uh, or destroy your re uh, reputation and such. And so these angels are actually moving and engaging on your behalf. You're a child of the Most High God, filled with the Holy Spirit. You're covered in the armor of God. Your sword is unsheathed. And there these angels come alongside of you to intervene and to give you strength and power in the fight, in the day of the fight. It's, it's something that we don't often think about. But in these last days, I think we'll need to be thinking like this more and more and more. Um, the sixth would be powers, and these are warrior angels who actually are the ones that fight demons. Now, when you think about Satan's kingdom, you take this hierarchy and then you just flip it on its head, and it's the opposite. So these powers, as we see even in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, these powers are warring. They're warriors warring against God's people and angelic beings who are fighting on their behalf. And so uh, these are powers. And then seventh, you have principalities. And we often put a pretty high price on principalities because these, just like dominions, are leaders. The, the principalities protect groups of people and or nations, and they send other angels on missions. So they are leaders without a shadow of a doubt. And they're very powerful. Um, I haven't mentioned any angel yet that is not powerful. <laughs> and every angel that has fallen is formidable. We have authority and power in Christ Jesus to fight in these battles. But if you're not engaged, if you're not clothed in the armor, if you're not filled with the Spirit, if you do not have a Provision, a provisioned handle on the Word of God, they will be a little more than formidable for you for a period of time and almost seem like you're getting everything handed to you because they want to kill, steal, and destroy. They want to terminate your ability to serve the King. And if you let them, they will take advantage of you all day long and night. So you have principalities. I thought something was interesting when you come to really the eighth uh, in the hierarchy, which is archangels. And archangels are very, very interesting because although they may kind of seem that they're towards the end, they can be assigned over principalities and they can be assigned over powers and they can be assigned over virtues and dominions. 
there aren't very many of them archangels. And so even in the fall, you wouldn't really be able to see uh, how many of the archangels did fall away. We do not know. I've uh, postulated a hypothesis on what possibly could be, but it, it is 100% speculation based on a few fragments of data. In the Bible, there is only one angel that is called an archangel. And it's in the book of Jude. And it is Michael, the archangel. And so Jude records uh, or reports in that, uh, in that book that there was a dispute over Moses' body. And there was contention between Satan and Michael, the archangel, it stated. And it says that Michael did not have a railing accusation to come against Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And that was enough. And if that was enough for Michael, the archangel, shouldn't that also be enough for us? Now, there's no doubt in Michael's mind that he knew who the Lord was and how powerful he was and how powerful his name is and the reference of him and how he operated in him fully. And so for us, we should have that same kind of boldness to say the Lord rebuke you. Sometimes we say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and that is biblical. I want you to know that, and we're going to look at that here in a minute. Um, but at the same time, the Lord rebuke you would most certainly be enough, especially as we default to Him and not ourselves, and especially as you begin to go up the ranks. So... We're fighting some basic demons, which is the ninth one, and that's what we're ultimately going to focus on. Typically, this is the realm that we engage in, and these are angels. These are what some people refer to as guardian angels, um, messengers, uh, the angels at the tomb, the angels uh, that, uh, that appeared to Lot uh, in Sodom. Um, these would be this class, but at the same time, you understand they're very powerful. The ones with Lot, people were trying to break into the house, right? To, to basically fornicate with these angels. That's how corrupt the city was. And what did the angels do? Blind everybody. Boom, they're all blinded. So, you know, these angels are very powerful, uh, can knock out thousands of people in one swipe. And then obviously you see with Elisha when he unveiled the eyes of his servant, that there are angels, uh, you know, tens of thousands of angels mounted on chariots of fire ready to engage the enemy, and they did. And so these angels are very powerful. In the fall, um, not, as a lot, not a lot is recorded um, in, uh, in the book on the fall itself. We know that at some point the fall had to have taken place between Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and Genesis chapter 3. So somewhere right in there after creation, because God said that it was very good, and he would not have said at the day of his rest that everything was very good if the fall had already taken place. He would have said, everything is very good except for a third of the folks just bailed on me. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't say that. So that's how we know that something happened here and we can gain some insight into what actually took place when we look at the book of Revelation. So when you look at the book of Revelation, you're going to see that there was a fall. There was a red dragon uh, that ultimately fell. But before we get into that, I want to speak a little bit more about archangels just for a second. Um, although the Bible is the only one that, 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 that uh, ascribes that title and that title is given to Michael, Michael the archangel, a lot of times we think Gabriel, right? Gabriel's an archangel. And, uh, and many people have said that and believe that. And you wonder why do they believe that? Because scripture does not necessarily say that he is. And so I ended up doing a little bit of a study here. And um, one of the books that was uh, part of, uh, we were talking about the Essenes and uh, this community of Messianic believers um, early church, period. Uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they also found the Book of Enoch that was there too. 
And so this was actually part of their theology. And if you've ever taken the time to read this book that was not canonized in the Bible, it does give some, uh, a lot of insight uh, into, into this war that's taking place. Now, if it's not under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then I, I don't know exactly how they would have gotten a lot of the information that they, that they put in that book. So maybe, and this is why it's not canonized, maybe some of it was under inspiration and some of it was of the thoughts of men, whereas the Bible that was canonized was God's thoughts through men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is inerrant, infallible, unchanging. And so as you look at that book or maybe look at some of the other apocryphal books uh, like uh, Second Ezra, it starts to actually talk about the names of different angels and starts to give them certain titles. Uh, obviously, the Catholic Church has held on to a lot of this, but they've taken it to a level that is uh, sacrilegious and apostate in that they are now worshiping angels. And every time in Scripture you see an angel where someone begins to worship them, what do they do? They stop them immediately and say, I'm just like you. I'm a servant just like you. Worship God. Worship God. Always pointing to Christ. So any angel, by the way, that, uh, that receives worship from you, okay, even though that might be a huge, amazing experience in your bedroom, angel manifests himself, angel of light, glorious time you're thinking this angel. If you begin to worship him and he receives it, it's not one of God's. It's one of Satan's who is presenting him as an angel of light and presenting himself as an angel of light. So I would love to, uh, for the church to begin having those experiences where the veil is being pulled back and we can see into the spiritual realm. It would really freak out a lot of folks, first of all, okay? It would freak you out. Um, and, and this is why the Lord doesn't let us operate that way all the time because we wouldn't look normal. <laughs> we wouldn't act normal. Get out of the way. Watch out, man. It's, and then you, it's like, this guy is out of control for Jesus. Is that a, he's like fighting the air over here. So, because <laughs> you would see him. So, um, he's merciful to us. Amen. He's merciful to us. The, uh, some of the names that are listed, if you look in the book of Enoch, it gives a pretty strong indication. Now, obviously, this is extra biblical. And I don't want you to ever get confused between what the Bible says and other things that you read. Because if you read, for instance, the book of Judas, which is a Gnostic gospel, it speaks against the deity of Christ. Okay, It's not bad to read, but it's basically having wisdom, understanding as you gain knowledge. Uh, because a lot of people are, are torn up today because they can't, they can't put two and two together and they can't separate one from the other. And so uh, I just want to list some of the names as, as, they, uh, as they have been recorded. And this is part of a, a, a hypothesis, obviously. I can't prove it. Um, but the names of the archangels are Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, obviously Michael, uh, Saquel, uh, Sakiel, Gabriel, and Ramiel. Those are the seven that are actually listed in the book of Enoch uh, at the very beginning. It also tells a story of the fall, which is kind of interesting because we don't have a lot of information on that in the Bible, but uh, it does somewhat line up to some degree. And if you don't know the story, the book of Enoch records that there were 200 angels that, uh, that decided to come down, and these were the sons of God who ultimately came down to uh, go into the daughters of men, basically fornicate with human women. There were 200, and even in this part of the rebellion, when they went off, everyone had sworn allegiance to one angel, and his name was uh, Shemyaza. And so they pledged allegiance that they would not turn away from this perversion that they were about to commit. And so they all descended. 
Then it gives the lists and names of basically the captains over 10. So there would be listed 20 captains over 10 of the angels. When it gives the list of those captains by name, it also gives the description of what they taught men. And they taught men fornication. They taught men sorcery. They taught men the use of weapons and how to build armor and all these other things. And basically how to make war and cause division and how to call on other demons to get power as opposed to from God. When, uh, when God began to condemn this, which happened over a period of time where it was sealed, their fate, for what they had done, one person actually stood up above everyone else, and it wasn't Shemyaza, it was Azazel. Azazel was actually called out above, and he was uh, prosecuted more heavily by God in that he was sentenced to darkness under sharp rocks. And it was because he taught uh, more wicked works to men than others. Now, Shemyaza, I believe, personally, was probably a dominion or a uh, principality. And Azazel, considering his last name and the way it ends with Uriel, Michael, Gabriel, Ramiel, Azazel, was one of the archangels that went with Satan. And because he was given a superior authority and could be used in a different way, he was obviously sentenced to a more harsher punishment than others. Purely speculation on Eric Philpott's part as I'm studying scripture and understanding and pulling these things together, that is a possible scenario. And I know maybe during a sermon, you don't wanna hear possible scenarios, you wanna hear the word of God. But as we do studies, like today is, and as we study these things, it's good to know these things. And so as I complete the hypothesis and, and, and develop the theory, it is that there was probably 10 archangels and three of them fell and seven of them remained faithful. One of them was Azazel and the number 10 means perfection. And that's how everything was before the fall. And now that the fall has taken place, it's seven, which is number of completion. And so uh, that's my theory on that based off of scripture and extra biblical scripture that, uh, that you would have to, to study out for yourself. But I want you to know that those things are available. And obviously in these last days, we wanna understand better how to fight. But this does give somewhat of a picture, whether that's true or that isn't true on the number of archangels. The reality is they do exist and one of them is definitely ascribed the title, and that's Michael. Um, as far as Gabriel is concerned, I thought some, some interesting things. Um, uh, obviously, if you look into the book of, of Enoch, you would see that Gabriel is listed as one of the archangels. We often refer to him as kind of a messenger. He's recorded uh, four times as speaking to men as a messenger in that capacity, twice to Daniel, once to Zechariah in the temple to, uh, to tell uh, Zechariah about John the Baptist. And then lastly, he's recorded going to Mary and telling her about Jesus. Every single time, ironically, he speaks about Jesus, the coming king, the one who will rule over nations, who will hold the golden scepter. And so the two times that he spoke to, uh, to Daniel, it was the second time when Daniel was praying. And Daniel was praying a prayer of repent, a repentance for Israel because they had gotten away completely. And from the moment he started praying and fasting, we've studied that before, he was praying and fasting, God was sending the messenger to him to, divine, to define the vision for him. And it took three weeks from the third heaven to the first heaven, going through the second heaven to get there. And he got great resistance from the prince of Persia. And a prince could very easily be a cherub. It's most certainly a principality and, uh, and or dominion. Uh, most people probably refer to the prince of Persia as a principality, right? 
prince of Pali, prince of Persia, it would make sense. What had to take place is Gabriel was trying to get this message. He obviously had an army of angels with him, and he was confronted by the prince of Persia and his angels, those that he were in charge of. And this battle ensued, and he called a cavalry charge from Michael the archangel, specifically Michael. And Michael came and took care of business so that he could break away and bring the message to Daniel. Now that's recorded in Scripture as far as these battles that are taking place when we pray. And so when we begin to pray, what we often do is we pray very light and loose and not very long. And so had Daniel stopped, I mean, could you imagine praying and fasting and say, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it to work for the next three weeks. I'm going to be praying and fasting. I've got a pretty serious problem. My nation is going to hell. And, and I've, I've, I've just, I've got a petition. I've got to go after this with everything I got. <laughs> that was Daniel. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, that was his attitude. And, and we just don't see that kind of attitude. Even, I mean, my attitude, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, that's, uh, how do you do that? Um, well, we're going to need to in these last days. But you see the battle that's actually taking place. So Gabriel brings him the message. Um, Gabriel and Michael are actually the only uh, angels that are named in the Bible, which is uh, interesting. Obviously, we have the other names that are listed, but that's also in the book of Enoch. But it's just Michael and Gabriel that are listed unless you look into the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, when you're talking about uh, the scapegoat, and one is to be sacrificed unto the Lord, and the other scapegoat is to be released into the wilderness, and you'll see in, uh, uh, in the book of Leviticus, and I cannot recall the chapter, but it's very easy to look up, um, because it says that the scapegoat will be released into the wilderness to be an offering or a sacrifice to Azazel. The sins of the people were placed on that scapegoat. It was sent out into the wilderness, basically to be devoured by the angel Azazel, who was punished, darkness and sharp stones, because of the fall as recorded in the book of Enoch. Strangely enough, in Jude, when it talks about Michael the archangel, that entire passage is a quote from the book of Enoch. It's very interesting that there is a connection there, and that's why I'm trying to make the connection now for, uh, for study purposes. Uh, <clears throat> Gabriel also uh, looked like a man uh, when he came to Daniel, so he very much looks like us, these angels. Uh, at least the archangels, as far as I can tell. And obviously angels can come to you as well. And the Bible tells us to be careful who are entertaining because we, we, could, we could be entertaining angels unaware. So they're going to look like us and can even manifest in a form that is very physical to where they can move items and or you can actually feel them. That's interesting because it seems as though demons have lost the ability to do that, which shows their inferiority. Demons, being fallen angels, and we'll look at this here in just one second, um, need a human to possess, and they want that. And they will take any avenue you give them, they are like water. They will try to get in to the unbeliever. I firmly believe that, that Christians can be oppressed and can be oppressed heavily, heavily, heavily. Um, believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit cannot be possessed, but I do not think that the Holy Spirit would allow the vessel, which is sealed unto redemption, Amen. to be possessed by a demon. That is off limits. That is not available. The problem that I see as a believer, and we'll look at this when we look at divination here in a second. When a believer does methamphetamine, 
They are giving permission. They are removing this and they are opening something up in their lives. And there are other ways to do it aside from that. I just wanted to go to the most extreme where you are breaching open your soul to be invaded by demonic entities. And so this is a very dangerous thing. This is also why in the last days it says that all nations will be subdued through sorcery, which is the word pharmakeia. It is to make everything broken open so that possession is easily obtainable in all souls by this demon horde, if you will, that's fallen. So again, I said, you know, when I start to do this study, it's very sobering for me. <laughs> But there's a real battle that's going on. Uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 19, when Gabriel is talking to uh, Mary, he says that he stood in the presence of God, which means that he had access to God um, and was actually sent on that sp specific mission. I'm thinking that archangels have that ability where God will summon them and then put them in charge of a certain number of dominions and virtues and powers and principalities. Um, and, and organize this force that, that works well to accomplish the mission. And that's not, you know, what I saw was in the military. You had scouts, artillery, infantry, and aviation. And so scouts went in first, then you soften it up with artillery, then you sent in cover fire, and then you'd send in your infantry behind it. We all work together. And then when you see the different branches, then we still work together, even with Air Force personnel uh, in training. And so even though they're different branches. So as I see the structure of the kingdom, I think of the, you know, kind of the Army, Navy and Air Force, if you will. Uh, it may be set up very similar because I don't think that we came up with it of how to do the different branches but how they still work together uniquely. So I think the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones was one. Dominions, virtues, and powers is two. Principalities, angels, and archangels, or archangels and angels would be kind of that third. And then you can take someone from another one and you can form groups to go out. I think it's that way because you kind of reverse engineer how demons work because we can see that often and sometimes we give more em emphasis on demonology than angelology. So the study of demons and the study of angels. We somehow can, can emphasize how horrible and how organized and how masterful demons are under Satan's power. But all of that power and authority and structure came from heaven. And so they're just taking what was already created. And so if they're that powerful, then I want to say something. That, that just maybe it hasn't occurred. The forces that are for us are greater in power and in number than the forces that are against us. Amen. You know that, right? Yes. We know this. The forces that work for us are greater in power and number than the forces that are working against us. The problem is we put too much emphasis on them and not on God. And this is where we, as believers, as God's children, this is where we set our shield of faith down. This is where we sheathe our sword. This is where we kick off our shoes and loosen up our breastplate. <laughs> Take off the belt of truth. It's a little tight. See what I'm saying? So I just I want us to get, uh, get this, this picture. Um... Obviously, I said that Gabriel was recorded speaking to three people, Daniel, Zechariah, and Mary. Um, interesting enough, Gabriel always points to Jesus. Even though he's given him clarity, giving them clarity, obviously with Zechariah, he's talking about the coming king. There's one that comes before him. Your son's name will be John. And Gabriel could identify the difference between the unbelief and the question that Zechariah had and the belief but question that Mary had. And so with Zechariah, Zechariah says, how can we have this child? We're old. There was a lack of belief. And he said, zip it for six months. Is <laughs> it nine? Nine months. Thank you. Nine months. Zip it. Zip it good. 
And uh, when Mary said, how is this possible? I'm a virgin. I've not been with a man. He recognized her belief. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the same kind of, this can't possibly happen kind of a deal, as opposed to, how can this happen? I, I don't understand. So he, he did not uh, quiet her for any period of time at all because of that. So angels can see and demons can see in the believer your level of faith. And I think it's because it would resonate in the spiritual realm as light. And the brighter the light, the more faith you have. And as they approach you and attack you and you start to retreat into yourself and you start to retreat back to your own thinking and coping mechanisms and whatnot, then your light begins to diminish. Well, if you're ever in a fight and you start to see your enemy go down, what do you often do? Let lighten up, wait for them to get their breath, wait for them to recover. No, you start to pound them with everything you've got to destroy them. And that's what Satan's uh, tactic is, is to destroy our faith. It's ultimately to destroy the believer's ability and to get them to live in sin. That's their mission. That's what they want to do. Take your eyes off of Jesus and live in sin. And your light is nothing as opposed to full faith you have this bright light and uh, it makes a difference. You go up to a guy when you have the light. By the way, uh, John and Phyllis had the opportunity to meet the gentleman that I met a few weeks ago at the, uh, at the gun show. They were at the, at the one in Fort Worth. And so they met the same gentleman and got the same exact response and nearly had an identical conversation. And, uh, and this guy was a professing messianic, his name isn't Jesus, Yeshua, you call him Yah, I'm a Hebrew priest kind of a guy. And, uh, and there's this, you know, but ultimately you asked him a question. Any question that's asked, by the way, guys, I will repeat it to make sure that we keep the continuity of conversation and making sure that everybody has it. But I can't recall this. What was the question that he asked that you really realized that, uh, that he was, that you guys were on the same boat, same, same page? Mm. So John said that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And this gentleman said, no, he did not. And that is a deal breaker every time this guy is not a believer. He is bound up in a uh, religious spirit, which is really a characteristic uh, of, a, of a type of spirit that's listed in the Bible, which we'll ultimately get to. Um, I keep saying we'll get to this, but I only want to focus on one today. And, uh, and I'm going to post the scripture for this week that you need to study um, for this first spirit, which is the, the spirit of divination. Obviously, we're very familiar with the fall of Satan and how that took place. And it was pride. And he was saying, I will lift myself up. Um, you can find a full description of the fall of Satan in these passages of scripture, so just write them down. Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 11. You can see more insight into this in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, what was that one? Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. And then lastly, in Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 to about 9. In that particular passage of Scripture, what you're actually going to see in this Revelation chapter 12 passage is that in this final battle, you're going to see Michael the archangel battling Satan. And it specifically says that Michael and his angels, so he's been assigned a certain team for this battle, and it says Satan and his angels are fighting. 
And so we know for a fact that Satan was a cherub. And we know that, that this class of archangel can actually have superiority and or equal ranking as a cherub. And so these are why these are, these are captains of captains, archangels, captains of captains. Um, but that's, uh, it ultimately says he was cast to the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, I would love to go into description of, of Satan, but I'm not going to do that for the sake of time. But here's the importance of it. If you study Satan's name and you study the names that he's been given, which would be Beelzebub, prince of this world, the prince of power of the air, the god of this world. He's also called the devil, a slanderer. He's called the evil one, a roaring lion, the red dragon, and the ancient serpent. Um, I'll try to put this in a, in, a, in a band post just so you have the scripture that you can go to. But here's the importance. If you study the names, you'll understand his tactics because he operates in that capacity. He is an accuser. If you ever are accused of something you didn't do, then know for certain that Satan is involved. It's got his fingerprints on it. Does it make sense? If someone is slandering you behind your back and they're professing to be a believer, it's happened many, many times. I would give more credence at this point in time to believe at least Satan is manipulating them masterfully for them to slander me behind my back. At least, at the minimum. At the most, they're lost as all days and they're just caught up in religion. You know what I mean? And so these righteous judgments need to be made in these last days because the Bible tells us that families will be torn apart in this time. That children will come against parents and, and the households will be divided three and two and two and three. And he says, I came to bring a sword and not peace. And uh, that sword oftentimes causes division. This sword right here. So uh, study that for yourself. It's important. And, uh, and I thought it was interesting that Azazel was mentioned very specifically in Scripture. Um, and, and that's where I made a connection that he is, he is one of the fallen uh, archangels. Again, that, that right there is, is speculation on my part. So I want to make very clear of that. But that's just how when I'm studying how I'm trying to connect dots and I'm, it's, it's a real study. It's, it's really searching, searching out and wanting more, wanting to know how this is built. This is something that God's people are really going to have to have in these last days. It is a deep hunger and desire to know him more fully. It's a deep desire to operate with full discernment, to be able to break apart what is of Scripture and what is of the world, what is extra biblical that might actually give some credence, but you understand its value in comparison to the Word of God. If I never saw the book of Enoch again, I could completely separate everything I've ever read out of there, and I would only want this book. And I'm telling you right now, with this book, you can defeat the enemy. Amen. This is the weapon. Everything is Alpha's auxiliary. As a matter of fact, when I think about it, I would much rather have my main weapon system, uh, have my N4 with my M203 grenade, grenade launcher, than my bayonet. The bayonet's nice. It's a nice auxiliary if something were to go wrong, but I would do it without it if I couldn't have my main weapon system. Nine mils nice, strapped to the side, but I'm telling you right now, in combat, I'd rather have my 5.56 millimeter, 19 pound weapon that's about... <laughs> 11 and a half twist through the barrel. All right, so um, this uh, spirit of divination, we talked about it last week, and then we're going to close. I know it's uh, right at 12. I'm going to be giving you more scripture than anything else at this point in time. So here's what the Holy Spirit told me. Stop feeding them. Give them the food and let them eat. We've got a little kitten at the house, right? 
And yesterday for the first time, she says, always bottle feeding, always bottle, always bottle feeding. Them. And, uh, and so we put a saucer of milk down yesterday for the first time to let the cat eat on its own instead of being bottle fed. It'll grow faster. It'll make better decisions if it does this. And so at first he took to it like it was no big deal. Boom. And I was like, wow, he's going to pick that up really quick. And then we pulled him out so he didn't drown. So, <laughs> so you know, I don't want to put too much on you. <laughs> I get it. But, but through the course of these weeks in the study, um, you'll have plenty of information to study. And so the level of growth in these last days um, is going to be exponential for those who want it. Because here's the thing that, that God is uh, God's doing right now. It, it used to be that he had a long time to work with somebody. So with Moses, he worked with them for 40 years in Egypt. He learned up all kinds of great stuff. And then 40 years in the wilderness, right? And then put him on mission at 80 to go and uh, free his people. And then spent how many years in the desert after that? Another 40, Another 40 years. 120 years Moses had to get there. Very smart, very smart, but still wasn't allowed to go into Canaan, which is always kind of like, ah, that's a bummer. You know, it's going through a lot. Here's the difference today. God doesn't have 120 years to work with somebody. So he's going to be downloading things very, very quickly, depending on, uh, you know, how quickly you want to receive it. And that's your desire and hunger, your desire and hunger. The more you desire, the more you hunger, the more he'll give you and he'll give it in mass. But he's not fooled. If you're not interested, he's not interested. You can say with your mouth, I want to grow. I want to grow. I want to grow. But he sees the heart and says, no, you don't. Don't lie. How come the Lord won't give me more? Because you don't want it. That's why. That's the truth. And he sees it. I can't. I'm just assuming that everybody just wants to take on as much and we can sit here for four hours and just take it in, take it in, take it in. Go, 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 go. <clears throat> but your hunger and your desire is going to be a reflection of your growth in these last days. And you will grow out of control. And it's going to be needed in these last days. So, um, the spirit of divination we saw last week in Acts chapter 16 uh, verses 16 through 18. This is the first spirit that we're going to study that's listed in Scripture. And it's, it's a significant one. So the spirit of divination, obviously we see that uh, this woman was a soothsayer and you know, right there out of, out of the gate, it was Paul and Silas, and she was commending them that these are men of the Most High God and lead the way to salvation. She was speaking a truth but after a few days of hearing this, and she was basically their biggest cheerleader at this point in time, Paul was grieved in his heart because he knew that there was another spirit there. And so it says in Scripture that Paul spoke to the spirit, not to the person, but to the spirit. And he said these words, and this is how quick it was. So this is why we need to operate in this capacity, because this was over within an hour after this was stated. Here's what Paul said. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come out of her. That's it. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it says when the next hour it took place. He didn't have to hang around and see it. He didn't have to, he, 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 didn't, he was like, man, I sure hope this worked. You know, I need to personally see this. No, he knew the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ and how he operated. And he spoke these words to the demon, and the demon had no choice to pack up his bags, which took about an hour, and get out. <laughs> and he was gone. And obviously they were uh, taken in by that, by the magistrate, by some of the other folks that were there, because they were making money off of this soothsayer. And so these men were beaten, Paul and Silas were beaten, and then thrown in prison. And it doesn't say they started praying until they were in prison. And they didn't start praying until midnight. 
And at midnight when they prayed and they sang psalms unto the Lord, there was a great earthquake and all the doors and the shackles were released from the prisoners. The guard himself, knowing that, 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 that he had failed in his duty, took out his sword and was going to kill himself. Paul said, hold on a second, everybody's here. And he came in and the very words out of his mouth were, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. And then this man took Paul and Silas to his house. They preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and him and his family got saved. They cleaned the wounds of Paul and Silas and Paul and Silas then in return baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the next day, the, uh, the magistrate said, we'll let them go privately. And you know what Paul and Silas said? No, here's the deal. You did all that publicly. You're going to do it publicly. And they ultimately did. Point. The spirit of divination was playing platitudes to their, to their ministry. And they were discerning enough to know that this was a spirit. And the rebuke necessary for the magistrates would have never taken place had they not addressed that spirit, nor would the jailer and his family gotten saved had they not addressed that spirit. And they actually suffered persecution and pain for the cause of Christ, all because they cast a demon out of a girl, the spirit of divination. So when we say that God works all things for His good and His glory. And we quote scripture and say that uh, all things, uh, uh, oh goodness, it slipped my mind. Uh, AJ would be able to jump in real quick. All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to His purpose. Amen. All things work together. So when we say that, and it seems like things are difficult and going in the wrong direction, but we've been honoring God on the mission, guess what? All things are going to work out Amen. for His good, for your good and His glory. That's how AJ says it. For, for your good and His glory. And that's the truth. We need to operate like that so that when we're fighting spiritually, we have this bright light and we believe it. It's not just something that you say. And if you don't fully believe it, say it every single minute until you believe it, until it's in you, until you're operating this way, that all things will work together for my good and His glory. Because had they not gone to prison, had they run, had they pulled out their AR-15s, uh, uh, swords, <laughs> <laughs> then it would have altered everything and they would have been out of His will. There's a time to fight. There's a time for flight. And then sometimes there's a time to just be right there in obedience in His will. And it might be painful. For them, it was just to say, we'll go. We'll go to jail. It's not right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to praise God. So here's some of the manifestations of the spirit of divination so that you can see it. And then I'm going to give you the scripture to back it up. And it's incumbent upon you this week to study it. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to believe a man instead of God. So I want you to study the Word of God, okay? Because in the last days, there are many that are going to be coming in the name of Christ and saying, I'm a prophet and Jesus is over here and all this other stuff. Now, I know that you guys trust me, but I want you to get to a place where you trust the Word of God more than you trust the any man. And so I want to give, you these, give these to you. Um... The manifestations obviously are fortune tellers. We can pretty much know that if you go to a fortune teller that they're going to be summoning demons and talking to demons seems pretty normal. These are also called soothsayers, but warlocks are going to be the same thing. And just recently I read an article that uh, was about Christian witches. Christian witches. Really, how do you, it's an oxymoron. How do you put those two things together? It's this new age that's entering into the church and now being a witch is cool. There's a lot of nice shows about it, right? So people are like, oh, this will be kind of cool. Black magic, white magic, it's all summoning demons, period. So warlocks, Satanists, witches, um, even Wiccan 
or druids. You know, that's not uh, something we hear about all the time. But in these last days, we actually would. Now, Wiccan and druids are all about nature, by the way. So there is this worship of nature and trees and the environment and the world and all this other stuff. And so this global warming and we got to save the world and the carbon credits and they're worshiping something else other than God. Mother Nature said Father God. I'm telling you what, he created it all. He can take care of it without a shadow of a doubt. And cows flatulating is not going to cause the whole world to fall apart. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, but even paganism, you know, and, and there's so many different things that can be associated with it, is going to be the spirit of divination. Just so you know, it's one spirit. It's one type of spirit, but these are the things that manifest, the characteristics that manifest. Um, zodiac, uh, the Bible actually calls it stargazing. Horoscopes, yes. Rebellion is actually going to be one of them as well. Rebellion is as witchcraft, um, the Bible tells us, and I'll give you the scripture for that as well. But this is the spirit of divination. So if we're, if we're, sometimes we'll say we'll pray against the spirit of rebellion in somebody's life. It's actually the spirit of divination. If we can call it by name and not just a characteristic of that spirit, then we're going, it's going to be more effective. You know, sometimes you say, would you, would you share more details about this so I can pray more specifically? And so this is how we're able to pray more specifically because we're actually addressing this particular Demon class. Question for you. You know, when you brought up the part about Daniel, and I'm sorry for those that can't be able to hear me. He's asking me a question. I apologize. I'll make sure I refrain it. Can we do it afterwards? If you don't forget? Yes. Or yeah, we can do it afterwards. Okay. We'll, we'll do that just like you guys are going to be talking and discussing this message here in a moment. Um, we're going to do the same thing there. Um, and I just want to finish off with these, with these scriptures as well, but um, this, this could be controversial for some, but it's very important that you allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, but hypnotism. Hypnotism is you going into a state where you're making yourself open to suggestion. And I'm only interested in the Holy Spirit guiding me, not some men who's putting me into a state. A lot of people will proclaim that there's good in it, but they'll proclaim that there's good in all this stuff. But God says that it is the spirit of divination. And there is specific scripture to speak to that. I'll give it to you here in a second. So hypnotist is enchantments. You're being enchanted is what's taking place. And this spirit is allowed to enter in. And also drugs, pharmakeia, the spirit of divination. This is an access for him. And I will, I will honestly say, and I was thinking about this this morning, I think it's going to be very, very, very difficult for a pharmacist to get into heaven. Hmm. I mean, I was just thinking about this morning, I was just thinking, these are, these are doctors that are prescribing, and often just for money, just for money. The more they can prescribe, the more money they make, and they could care less of, of really what the problems are. So you take something, you have a side effect, they give you a pill for the side effect instead of trying to actually correct, correct the problem. And then you're just dealing with symptom after symptom after symptom. The next thing you know, you get this cocktail of 15 different pills and they're making money off of it. Meanwhile, you're dying because the, the, the symptoms are only being addressed and not the problem. And so for a pharmacist to do this to another human being is, is malicious, but he's under this spirit of divination. Yeah, yeah. The doctor. No, that's what I'm saying. The doctor is, you know, uh, it's interesting how sin will be judged, but the person that harbors that sin will be condemned. Well, let's also put faith in something other than God. Putting faith in something other than God. That is absolutely correct. That's what John uh, just made a statement about. So let me give you these scriptures, and then we'll pray. Um. You can write them down now. I'm also going to make sure that I put them on band. But, uh, but every single thing I just listed as far as the manifestations 
is in these scriptures. Acts chapter 16, 16 through 18. Micah chapter 5, verse 12. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6. Exodus chapter 22, verse verse 18. Isaiah 47, verse 13. Leviticus 19, verse 26. Jeremiah 10, verse 2. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. Deuteronomy 18, verse 11. Isaiah 19, verse 3. Galatians 5, verse 20. Revelation 9, verse 21. Revelation 18, verse 23. Revelation 21, verse 8. Revelation 22, verse 15. Notice the emphasis out there on Revelation. Is something we're most certainly going to see a lot of in these last days. And then only two, two more. It's uh, Hosea chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, Hosea 4, verse 12. And then Exodus chapter 7. Through nine. Oh, chapter seven. Chapters, nine. yeah. There's specific verses in there that, that talk on this, but those are really good to read because it's speaking about a lot of other things as well. That it, it's a good read. And this is all scripture based on the spirit of divination. Correct. Okay. Yep. This is the spirit of divination. Those are the scriptures that are going to focus on the spirit of divination. Okay. And then rebuking and binding specifically the spirit of divination when it's attached to these things. So it's like you're finally, we're, we're going to address the head, the problem. Rebellion is a symptom of the spirit of divination. You know, paganism is a symptom of, of these things. And so uh, drugs are a symptom of a spirit, the spirit of divination. And so, anyway, um, truth is how you will refute it. And then next week, we're probably going to cover several, uh, but like familiar spirits and the lying spirits, uh, spirit of jealousy, and then a perverse spirit. Um, And I'll just, we'll take one and we'll just look at those. There's a lot of scriptures that you can study, but just study one a week and then get proficient at identifying them. Yeah, it's gonna yeah, it's gonna be familiar spirits. Familiar. familiar spirits next week. Familiar spirits. Praise God. I, I pray that the study on Sundays is going to be um a blessing. I know that several people have asked about this particular study so they can understand better. Um when it comes to your proficiency, less of you, more of him. Less of you, more of him. There are only two places in Scripture that talk about the gifts that have been placed in you and the gifts that God will give you for a time. We we always say, what are my gifts? There's two places in Scripture. Study them. Understand them. They will jump out as far as what your gifts are when you go over them. And then ask God to continue to reveal those. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, the armor of God. We just looked at it. 
it's some very basic equipment that we're supposed to be wearing and it should be solidly fitted uh, at this point in time. If it's not, then ask him, what does the, the helm of salvation truly mean? And, uh, and the Lord will begin to guide you. Uh, the, the battle is for the mind. And so salvation is a must if you're going to wash your mind. And it's being protected. The helm of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? The belt of truth, having your feet shot at the preparation of peace. Because we should, we should be at a place right now where everybody understands who they are in Christ to a large degree and understands their gifts and the question shouldn't be, what are the gifts, but how do I deploy the gifts more aptly, more proficiently, and ready to engage the enemy. So we're going to start going over identifying the enemy and then how to engage the enemy, understanding the kingdom that's around us. It's very sobering as we walk out there and think that in this second heaven, there is a battle that's going on. And we see it right now in our society as a whole. We can see the hot spots in our nation right now. And maybe it seems calm here, but I'm sure it isn't because I think complacency is, is one of the big problems that uh, the church has as a whole as well. And uh, it means that we're capitulating or falling back in that area because it will come here. You know, it will touch our society. So lastly, and then I really want to stay, say this one thing. God bless everybody. Right now in our society, people are in denial or they're living in fear. They're in denial or they're living in fear. And I'm here to tell you soon, reality will change both of those. If you're fearful, then pray to God that you not be fearful because it will make you weak. It will make you a coward. And it is the first thing listed of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fearfulness. It's devastating. We talked about, we'll talk more in depth about the spirit of fear as well, but we've been talking about that, praying against. I've been on the radio talking about it with AJ um, to as many people as you can that this is one of the things that the spirit of fear is, is moving quickly across the land. Reality changes that. And so denial is a, what a lot of people are doing. They're like, ah. I think the denial right now is what's kind of slowed things down, to be honest with you, because they just refuse to recognize that this economy is, <laughs> is tragically in a, in, a, in a bad state. And people aren't realizing it. They'll read some numbers and, you know, 50% uh, of small businesses aren't going to be here in 2021. And people are like, that's not possible. That's not going to happen. Well, reality has a way of changing that. So I know that some people are in denial. That's why I want to focus on this because we're going to need to engage in the spiritual battle heavier than we ever have. And these demons manifest... And they manifest in a certain way. And God living in us is going to manifest in this realm. He needs to manifest in this realm. And so we're going to be talking about these spirits and the manifestations because it's, it's incumbent upon God's people if this is going to turn around. I think we've read that before somewhere. <laughs> I pray so many, Father, God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you give us uh, all the answers. It's amazing how we can dive into your word and it continues to reveal more and more truth of who you are uh, and who we are. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that you brought us together today. Lord, I thank you for the times of testimony and fellowship and worship this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, I ask that you would impart your truth and insight into every single person that is hearing this message and has these scriptures. Lord, that you would use them mightily through the course of this week to grow them. Father, I pray that they would have a deep desire, hunger, and thirst for your word, that they would study these things to become very proficient in identifying the enemy so that we can fight the good fight of faith. Lord, we long for your return. And if so, Lord, 
come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Bless you, everybody. I pray that this study is helpful. Amen. Amen.